please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I would be remiss as a U.S. history major to not to fail to point out that even though we like to celebrate our independence on July 4th, the Continental Congress actually declared independence on July 2nd. And it's kind of a quirky little thing that the 4th of July is the celebration date. If you're interested into knowing more about that, I can explain it to you, but I won't waste your time in the sermon. I'll just, you know, pop, it, pop off occasionally, right? As I was thinking about, you know, we've been talking, talking about the Ten Commandments for these last several weeks. And of course, we've been using that same passage from Matthew as our gospel text, because when you're studying the Ten Commandments, that particular gospel reading is very applicable. But thinking about the Ten Commandments reminded me of something that happened several years ago. I mean, every so often you hear about it again and again, but it's this desire to place the Ten Commandments in public places, in government-sponsored ways. And I was thinking about that because, well, what is that about, right? And if you ask people that advocated for it, they'll say, well, but the Ten Commandments are the foundation of Western law. Now, that's not a very critical analysis of our various and complex legal history. Um, and in fact, given our legal system's reliance on pagan Roman and pagan Germanic traditions, I'm not even sure it's really quite as accurate as people seem to think it is. And the other thing is it apparently seems to think that only Jews and Christians believe that murder, stealing, and lying is wrong, which if you've talked to any people of any other religious traditions, they'll tell you, guess what? They think those things are wrong too. So I'm not exactly sure what that is really about, wanting to put the Ten Commandments in courthouses and such, because a lot of religions believe those things. So I'm not sure what that's about. But one thing it does make me think about, though, is the danger of using religious symbols like the Ten Commandments, because for us, sometimes we like to use those symbols to justify ourselves, to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves on our piety and our religiosity. Sociologies talk about this thing called virtue signaling. Anybody ever heard that term, virtue signaling? Okay, darn it, I'm going to have to explain it. Well, I was going to explain it anyway, but I thought I was hoping to. Virtue signaling is this action or this practice that you publicly express opinion or a sentiment, and it's intended to demonstrate your good character or your moral correctness on a particular issue. And we all do it. It's not something unique. You see bumper stickers all the time. Well, that's really virtue signaling, right? I mean, I'm putting this on my bumper sticker. You know, I love Jesus or America, God bless America or save the planet, right? And really, those are symbols. They're, they're signaling to say, I believe these things. These are important to me. And at its best, it really is a call to us to live those values. But sometimes in virtue signaling, we're really just signaling that we want people to think that we value those things. And that's where you kind of run into problems. It's, it's easy to say you do believe certain things. It's much harder to live those out. And the Ten Commandments can become like a bumper sticker. It can become a way of virtue signaling to others, look, I'm a good person. I believe the Ten Commandments. And there's other ways that we virtue signal too, other than bumper stickers. We also like things on Facebook. I'm guilty of this. I feel so good about myself when I like something on Facebook because look, everybody can see just how virtuous I am. Yeah, right, right. It really is hard to click that little button. Yeah, it really is hard, especially on my touch screen, because, I mean, you know, I'm an old guy. I don't know how to use these touch screens. That took a real effort. Or putting a sign in our window or, uh, or wearing a particular symbol on our shirts. 
And these, these are important things. They send important messages. There's nothing wrong with virtue signaling. But we need to always move beyond just the signaling part into, well, what does this symbol really mean? And do we really take it seriously? Because that's the hard part. It's easy to signal the virtue. It's a much harder thing to live out that virtue. Now, the Ten Commandments themselves, if we take them seriously, they do prevent us from using them as virtue signaling. The first commandment when it says, no other gods before me. Well, if you take that really seriously, then you realize we all frequently fail to follow that commandment. We frequently place other gods before God. The same thing goes with idols. Oh, don't construct any idols. Well, if we don't look too closely, we can say, well, Chris, I don't have any metal you know, stone or, or clay idols in my house and in the church. We don't have any of those things. That's true. We usually don't. But we are more creative than that. We find other idols in our lives, don't we? We're really good at that. Taking God's name in vain. Again, on the surface, well, I don't use the word G-O-D in any context other than a religious one. Okay, well, good. But do you really follow the command to honor God and to honor God's name? That's nah, a little trickier, isn't it? A little harder. Sabbath. Well, actually, that one, let's be honest. Most of us, I think, realize we're not great with Sabbath. That's not one that we tend to delude ourselves. We know we're not good with that one. Or honoring our father and mother. Well, I always honor my father and mother. I mean, at least as long as they're reasonable, right? <laughs> and maybe when they become grandparents, they'll become more reasonable. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the way that works. We, we're not good on that one either. And sure, murder, yeah, nobody, well, I shouldn't say. I don't know. Most of us probably haven't murdered anybody. But do we will what's best for our neighbor? Do we think positive thoughts towards our neighbors? Do we truly love our neighbors and will their prosperity? Adultery. Now, most of us probably have not cheated on our spouses. But every time I read this, I'm thought about, I think about one of my professors in seminary and she was talking about when she was pastoring a church back in the 90s, and this was when a time in the 1990s where we were learning more about, well, the adults in this group will remember this, we were learning a lot more about certain things that people did sexually that we didn't really want to know, and particularly about a particular president. And the, one of her older parishioners was you know, angry about this, and he's like, I have never been unfaithful to my wife in all the years that we have been married. And the pastor, this is the trouble with being a pastor, is we know certain things, you know? We can't say what those things are. And she's thinking to herself, she's like, well, it might be true that you've never technically cheated on your wife, but, you know, I've, and she doesn't say this, but she's thinking, I've heard you disparage your wife in public. I've heard you make fun of her. I've heard you do all sorts of things against your wife in, in many ways. So I'm not sure saying you're faithful to your wife and that you've always been faithful is really the right thing, because that's very narrow understanding of faithfulness. But we do that sometimes when we want to feel good about ourselves. I've never been unfaithful. Really? Really? Let's deconstruct that a little bit. Oh, well, no, 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 let's not do that. Okay, okay, fair enough. And of course, you know, stealing. Well, maybe I haven't physically stolen something from someone, but there are many other ways to take things that rightfully belong to others. And false witness. Maybe we, maybe we never truly lie, but there are many other ways of deceiving people in ways that we can feel not so bad about. So at their best, those nine commandments deny us the opportunity to use them to make us feel good about ourselves if we are really serious about listening to them. Because unfortunately, it still is very easy to use them to justify ourselves, to congratulate ourselves. I follow all these laws. And of course, it's hard for anybody else to tell you you don't. 
right? They don't, as far as they know, you do always, always tell the truth. You're never unfaithful to your wife. You always honor God. You always follow the Sabbath. So there's still very much a danger of using them for virtue signaling. But that's why I think there's the beauty of that 10th commandment. It's our final protection. Because it says, thou shalt not covet. And guess what? That gets us every single time. Every time, without exception. Because here we see inside the Hebraic mind that sees thoughts as a prelude to action. As Jesus says, as someone thinks, so they do. What happens in the heart, what happens in the mind, it matters just as much as what we do. See, we can signal our virtue all we want, but if our hearts aren't truly aligned with God's will, we're not really in the right. If we desire something that belongs to our neighbor, we're not following the laws of God. We are truly loving our neighbor. Perhaps you've been in situations in your life where you're like talking to somebody and they start talking about their new car or their new job. And all you're thinking about is, gosh, I wish I had that car. Gosh, I wish I had that job. And you think, gosh, and if you think about it in hindsight, you're like, wow, in that moment, you actually stopped connecting to them. You stopped relating to them. You even, in a sense, kind of stopped loving them in that moment because all you were thinking about is how you wanted what they had. So we aren't really truly loving our neighbors if we're desiring what they want, what they have. And not only to make it really even special to us, notice that unlike the other commandments, this one is actually stated twice in the commandment. It says, don't covet twice in the same passage. By prohibiting coveting, though that is unenforceable, it attempts to prevent us from leading to desires that will violate those other nine commandments. Thou shalt not covet as a guardian to help us from not falling into sin with the other nine. I was thinking about, you know, our Pledge of Allegiance, which we said this morning, and we say a lot throughout our days in this country. And many people, maybe even most people, are very passionate about the pledge. You know, we say it, we stand, we place our hands on our hearts, and we say it out loud together. And that is a very good thing for us to do as a country. But as I was mentioning to the little ones, and as, it, as is true with the Ten Commandments, it's easy to say. It's much harder to take those words to heart. It's easy to say that we believe in an indivisible nation. It's easy to say that we believe in liberty and justice for all. But oh my gosh, the devil is always in the details, isn't it? It's just so much harder to live out those words. An indivisible nation is made up of peoples from differing races and languages and cultures and religions. That's what Reverend Bellamy was talking about when he wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. And liberty and justice for all. Who's included in all and who isn't? Do we really mean all when we say that? Or are we only talking about people who look like me, think like me, come from the same country as me? It gets a lot harder then, doesn't it? When we start asking ourselves these difficult questions. Does the Pledge of Allegiance apply to the Mennonite who doesn't believe in serving in the military because they believe that all violence is wrong? Does the Pledge of Allegiance apply to the Jehovah's Witness who's bullied in school because his religion prohibits him from taking secular oaths? And that's how their religion views the Pledge of Allegiance, so they don't say it in school. And so they're bullied because they stand out as different. 
Does the Pledge of Allegiance apply to the atheist who can't say the pledge because under God, effect bothers them as they believe in every other part of the pledge, but they feel like they'd be a hypocrite to say the pledge because they don't believe in God. Does it apply to them too? If the pledge is to be more than just virtue signaling for us, we need to acknowledge that it is truly for everyone. Everybody, even those who can't say it for whatever reason. We say it for them because we can. We say it for them, not against them. We say these words because we truly believe them and acknowledge that maybe not everybody can say the words, but that's okay. Because we believe the words, that's why it's okay. We live out the words, that's why it's okay. That's the Ten Commandments too for us. It's a reminder that the commandments are not just about virtue signaling here. They're not just words to congratulate ourselves and pat ourselves on our back for how religious we are. They are words that stand in judgment over us. They are words that call us to account. They are words that call us to change. If we miss that importance of those commandments, there's always the tenth one, those shall not covet, that will get us where the others might fail. Because it's not just a change of our words we're talking about here. It's a change of heart is what's called for. And just as our Pledge of Allegiance, which represents our greatest ideals as a country, calls us to something higher, but can also be turned into an empty ritual if you don't think about it, the Ten Commandments can also have that happen to them. They can become something utterly alien to the faith that demands that we love God and love our neighbor. And heck, we have all seen, haven't we, supposedly religious people who are just really good at being hateful. We all know people like that. And we've seen people that get so excited about saying the pledge, but they clearly don't believe in an indivisible nation with liberty and justice for all. It's so easy to say words, even say words we don't really believe. But it is so much harder to do what the words call us to do and to change our hearts to live them out. Amen.